Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Sunday School Dropouts. It is so wonderful to have everybody here today. Uh, I'm super excited for our episode. Today, we are going to be having a conversation with Erica Smith, and we are going to be talking about sex, baby. Erica is a sex expert. And so she is going to talk to us a lot about some of the pieces of sexual education that many of us who grew up in high control religion and purity culture were not able to learn uh, due to our abstinence only sex education. So this is the second episode in our purity culture mini series, which I'm really excited about. If you listen, if you haven't listened to our first episode, I would really encourage you to go back to it. Andrew and I had a wonderful conversation about not only kind of like what purity culture is and why it can be so harmful, but we talk about some of the impacts for ourselves personally, what we're seeing in our offices, some of the variety of ways that we work with our clients when it comes to purity culture. And so these episodes kind of all go together. And then if, and then just as a another quick little disclaimer, Um, since we have the holidays coming up, we are actually going to take a tiny break from our purity cultures series, and we're going to do some episodes specifically about the holidays. But then when the new year hits, we have four more episodes about purity culture and some variety of, of just different things, uh, that pertain to it. So I'm really, really excited. So make sure that you stay tuned, uh, for all of this. So we are going to uh, get into the episode shortly, uh, or the interview with Erica shortly. But of course, like we have on many other episodes, I just want to offer a brief little disclaimer because we do recognize that some of the topics that we discuss in any of our episodes uh, may bring up feelings, emotions, and triggers that might require more processing or be too much to handle right now. So please always feel free to skip any episode or parts of episodes uh, and come back if and when you're ready. Our goal is to help you trust your body and your lived experience. And so you can take what you need and leave what you don't. We are so excited to have Erica Smith as our guest today. Erica is an experienced, award-winning, and internationally recognized sexuality educator who provides public and private sexuality education, consulting, training, and speaking. She is frequently sought out as an expert on various sexuality topics by major media platforms, podcasts, and publications, and her main area of focus is sex education for people leaving high-control religions. So you can see why we are bringing her in today. Erica developed the Purity Culture Dropout Program in 2019 to help people learn all of the sex education that they missed out on when they were growing up in purity culture. And she's wanting to teach people sex ed that is accurate, queer inclusive, trauma informed, compassionate, and most of all, comprehensive, because that is something we all missed out on. Under the Purity Culture Dropout umbrella, she provides intensive individual work, support groups, webinars, one-day intensives, as well as one-on-one education and consulting sessions to anyone seeking sex ed support and to establish and emerging professionals. Before shifting her work to working with folks post-purity culture and high-control religion, Erica provided comprehensive sex education, HIV prevention services, and support to young women and LGBTQ plus youth detained in Philadelphia's juvenile justice system and has been supporting transgender youth and their families since 2002. Erica is based out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but works with clients all over the world in an online format. You can find out more about Erica by going to her website, ericasmithac.com. And all of Erica's information is linked in the show notes uh, below. So without further ado, I would love to talk about sex with Erica Smith. It's funny. I was telling some another one of my friends, colleagues, of just being excited about this one. And they asked me why. And I was like, I'll be, I'll be honest. Like, I think I followed Erica's page on Instagram like three years ago when I first made my account. So it's mm-hmm. like, I don't know you as well as Laura knows you, but like I've known of you and I've known of your work and I've like really appreciated it for so long. So it's like, 
I've not talked to you directly, but it's been a long time coming. And so I really am appreciative of you being here today. That means so much to hear. Because sometimes when you're on social media, you feel like you're just shouting into the into nothingness. So to know that it's being received and um, received well is always nice to to hear. Absolutely. And I can relate to that feeling. Yes, yes, (laughs) absolutely. Great. You are. Yeah, very much appreciated. And so thank thank you you for being here. Yes. Yes, I echo that. Yeah, just Eric and I have had uh, an online parasocial relationship for years now. So it's good to to be in person as much as we can. I love it. <laughs> yeah, well, let's jump in. Um, and maybe you can start, Erica, by just giving us a little bit of a brief overview of how you kind of got into this work with individuals coming out of purity culture, especially because that's not your own background. Yeah. And I know that makes me basically a guest in some spaces. And I always feel very grateful that I am um, welcomed as a guest into these spaces since it's not my lived experience. I have been um, a sex educator and somebody who has worked in the sexuality field since my college days. And my college days were the late 90s. So that was a while ago. And I started out... um, as a young person, very interested in feminism and gender equality. And in college, I majored in uh, women's studies. And my work immediately following college was in a sexual health clinic and in an abortion clinic. And then I worked as a sex educator and HIV prevention counselor with youth in detention for 17 years. So I have quite a, quite a, you know, a lot of experience in the sex education world and in human sexuality in general. I also received a master of education in human sexuality education in 2007. And the way I got started specifically working with folks in purity culture is it's interesting. It it felt at first almost accidental, but as the years have gone by, I've realized that it's very, it's very, I'm on brand and and it seems, I don't know, it feels like exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm. And I was always a sex educator that I didn't have a public platform. I just, you know, worked for hospitals, worked for community-based organizations. I didn't have any name recognition. I was just doing the work for like 20 years. And then I did start talking to folks um, around early 2019 because I read Linda K. Klein's Pure. And I started asking people, were you raised in purity culture and how's that affected you? And the responses that I got from people were just, I mean, as you can imagine, people just pouring out all of this stuff to me. Mm -hmm. And I started just to put it all together. And I realized that throughout most of my career, I have, I have wanted to give sex education to people that needed it the most and could could experience the most like radical transformations through receiving sex education. For a long time, that was teenagers. For a long time, that was like young, marginalized LGBTQ youth in the city of Philadelphia. But I also, throughout my career, have been fighting the religious right in some sense. Um, Not just Mm -hmm. when I worked in abortion care, but then when I worked in HIV prevention, we were fighting for funding and all of it was going to abstinence-only education. Mm. Yeah. And so I've feel like my whole career, I've had this, you know, this awareness about what was happening in in American politics in regards mm-hmm. to sexuality and what happened to people when they didn't get good sex ed. And it was never good. But mm-hmm. realizing what purity culture did, it wasn't just giving, it wasn't just an absence of sex education. It was an addition of here are all these fears, here are all these things for you to be terrified of and things we're going to lie to you about. And realizing that is a whole different ball game and that I feel like I'm very equipped to provide compassionate, understanding, trauma-informed sex education to the people who need it the most. And Mm -hmm. in doing that, it also feels like a revenge of some sort um, (laughs) to to the system that established purity culture in the first place to be like, I'm going to welcome all of the folks that feel like they were harmed by this and give them the information that they have 
always wanted and maybe don't even know they need at this point. Um, mm-hmm. Just to be the guide in that with my yeah. sexuality expertise. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think yeah. that's so I, I can really appreciate that because, you know, obviously we grew up in purity culture. Mm-hmm. And so like, there can sometimes be that thought of like, oh, this was just us, you know, like there's, you know, we just grew up in this weird little kind of sect of people that, you know, believe this stuff. But it was interesting as at the time of this recording, just a few weeks ago, I got done recording my audiobook and the producer um, who grew, I, I recorded it up in Minnesota. I was staying there. So he was also from Minnesota, did not grow up religious, but was so familiar with everything I was talking about in regard to purity culture, because he grew up with the exact same thing. He was loosely Mm. affiliated with his church. I mean, he grew up Catholic, was loosely affiliated with that. But because of just the time that he grew up, we we graduated the same year from high school. He was like, oh, yeah, like all the kids in my school were talking about true love weights. And all the kids in my school were like doing these abstinent pledge, abstinence pledges and things like that. And I think in my mind, I just like that was shocking for me to hear because I'm like, you weren't even religious. And yet this was so deeply impactful. So I just I love that you saw that and were like, oh, this goes far beyond like, yes, it's a part of high control religion, but it it also goes so far beyond that into things like legislation, sex education uh, curriculums in our schools, things like that. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of the folks that I work with and talk to, they weren't homeschooled and they didn't go to Christian private schools. They went to a public high school in a American city and still got purity culture object lessons, you know, the chewed up gum stuff. They still got mm-hmm. and, and, you know, it's it's terrifying to me that there is such a resurgence of that um, attempt to silence any kind of sexuality information. And which Mm -hmm. makes me feel like, unfortunately, I'm never going to, I'm never going to be out of work. I don't want to do this work. I wish I, I had no reason to do it, but seeing the way that young people are being denied conversations about sexuality now means that in 20 years, there's still going to be people that are like, I need to talk mm-hmm. about this. I feel like that actually already partially answers the next question I had for you. But I, I, I am curious, like, and just in terms of like your whole career, and as you kind of were going more into like purity culture, like that being a big emphasis, what were some of like the long term negative psychological factors that you were that you were starting to really notice? Like, what were some of the themes that you started to notice? I mean, one of the biggest is just the fear and the terror in places uh, where regarding certain facets and aspects of sexuality that I've never known people could be that afraid. Um, Because I don't know, if you grow up knowing the facts and being given room to think about your own feelings about this stuff and to make your own decisions, it doesn't seem so scary. But the, the you know, the long-term psychological effect that always stands out the most to me is just the sheer terror in, in aspects of sexuality that I would have never even thought someone could be afraid of. Um, and, you know, to me, an example is like how a lot of folks I worked with, they weren't even allowed to like hug the opposite gender the opposite gender when they were, you know, the, the Christian side hug. I'm like, wait, mm-hmm. adults would let you <laughs> hug each other. No yeah. wonder you are still so afraid of, you know, how you might come off to a man or how you as a man might offend a, a woman, mm-hmm. like just the, the deep fear that is intentionally instilled in people is that is the thing that, that, constantly uh just amazes me you know i never get Mm. i tell my clients all the time like there's nothing sexuality related that i'm ever shocked about like you could tell me that you're into xyz and i'm not gonna i'm not even gonna register on my face that that is at all interesting (laughs) um but (laughs) when they tell me things that they were told in bible school or that they were told in youth group or that they were told by their, you know, the youth group leader's wife or whatever, that is when I'm like, (gasps) like, I cannot control my face. And Mm. I've been told by my clients that that they appreciate that because they they thought it was so normal. 
to be afraid mm-hmm. of, you know, dating, to be afraid of intimacy, to be afraid of holding hands, to be so yeah. desperately afraid of pregnancy that you think it could happen after you kiss somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It's the fear, the fear. <laughs> it's just yeah. so, so deeply rooted. And it springs up in places that I just have never seen fear around sex before. You mentioned like even the hugging piece and like, oh yeah, that was a world I grew up in. Um, mm-hmm. And and then even as I got older, like into like late adolescence, early adulthood, like if you were still in the church, it was like, what is that called? The Billy Graham rule, I think. The oh, not even not yes. even being not even being alone with the uh, opposite gender. It's like yes. that's like yeah. touching is yeah. not even we're not even talking touching, even physical yeah. proximity is like mm. what comes in and as my role as a sex educator is then I I like to be able to explain to people what what are typical common milestones of adolescent development Mm -hmm. and what kind of things teenagers need. And one of them is touch and to be able to like be intimate with friends and to practice those sorts of intimacies. So to be told that it is bad to hug a boy or to sit close to a boy or any of that is, you know, I, I, like to to share the information like no that's a pretty common like teenage it's a way we figure out the world around us it's a way we figure out how we interact with other people so mm-hmm. to have that pathologized is mm. is where so much fear and mm. harm starts yeah and you know i know we both know dr tina scrimmer sellers and so she's done some work around this i'm curious to know your thoughts too like We have these psychological impacts. And then I also see a lot of physiological or physical impacts. Um, I know like Dr. Tina talks a lot about how one of the things she noticed was like the physiological symptoms so similar to sexualized violence in her students Mm -hmm. where they would write about these experiences and what they were feeling as they're even recalling them. And she noticed this correlation. I've noticed that in my own work as well. Per- actually, personally, me as a, as a human, but then so much with my clients. And even with the supervisees that I um, supervise towards licensure, they're so confused because they're like, my client has to have been sexually violated because all these symptoms are lining up. And it turns out like, oh, no, they were, quote unquote, just a part of purity culture. So, yeah, is that, you know, as you're working with clients, what are some of those physiological impacts that you're seeing? I mean, that particular assertion of Dr. Tina's that purity Mm -hmm. culture can cause many of the same uh, experiences as actual sexual violence has been a revelation for so many people who are like, that makes me feel so much better. Because I work with people that are like, my therapist said that there had to have been something that happened and she can't believe I wasn't you know, Mm -hmm. somehow sexually violated. So they feel like, holy shit, like everything makes sense when they learn that that that's not an uncommon experience. Mm -hmm. Um, So physiologically, the the biggest one would be pelvic floor dysfunction and Mm -hmm. having actual pain or complete inability to experience penetration. And Mm -hmm. for some people, that's just sexual penetration. But I've also worked with folks um, who you know, they, they have difficulty at a gynecologist, they have difficulty inserting Mm -hmm. a tampon. Um, There's often fear and revulsion of their own genitalia. Mm -hmm. Um, And I see this more with female assigned folks, but I do work more with female assigned folks. I have Mm -hmm. male clients as well, but for, for this in particular, there's just, you know, the, this like, my genitals are a mystery and they're gross and I mm-hmm. I don't even want to look at them. I don't really interact with them, um, that mm-hmm. aspect of it. Some just freezing up whenever a sexual encounter presents itself. So mm-hmm. even if even if we're talking about like maybe this guy's going to kiss me tonight or maybe this woman is going to – this person I'm dating, they might want to make a move tonight. It's like mm-hmm. high alert. Like people are just – don't know how to to navigate a situation like that. And it's more than just not knowing what typically happens on a date. It's like that plus the like a trauma response of, yeah. oh my gosh, mm-hmm. like I can't believe I'm gonna have to maybe maybe touch someone or someone wants yeah. to engage with me physically. And yeah. a big one that comes up a lot is 
and I talk about this a lot on my social media because I hear it so much, is this idea that if someone desires me, it has to mean they don't respect me. So mm, I immediately I feel that. if that yeah. person thinks I'm hot, that it all correlates to mm-hmm. they don't respect me. They don't value me as a person because they want to have sex with me, which could lead me to sin. And mm-hmm. it all comes back to like, sex is bad. So if this mm-hmm. person wants me, it's yeah. bad. Um, yeah. And then I find folks who don't know how to express their desire to others or are afraid to even feel desire because mm-hmm. they're like, I don't want to disrespect that person. Um, mm-hmm. The separation of yeah. just general, like, human feelings of desire, of um, arousal, those things get pathologized so badly Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. it makes people have a difficult time just experiencing them organically. Yeah. Yeah. That is such such a thing. I see that so often, even with like, Mm -hmm. I work with many different clients, but like in male clients, for example, who've come out of purity culture and high high, um, control religion, I see a lot of um, like, for example, folks who they in their church, even according to purity culture, they did the right thing and waited until marriage, everything. And then it's like, but then that physiological response where it's like sexual arousal is just, it's shut down because it's inherently shameful. It's bad. It's Mm -hmm. gross. It's not safe. And it's just like, and then there's like this bewilderment of like, well, what the hell? Like we literally did what we were supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And then like, and then like on our wedding night, it's like everybody wanted something to happen, nothing happened. And then there's just all sorts of like, you know, confusion, shame, just all sorts of things. And mm-hmm. it's definitely something that something that comes up a lot. Yeah. I know. I'm like nodding along. I'm like, cool. You're just explaining my entire growing up years. Okay. What's, you know, (laughs) I've done a lot of of therapy around that, but yeah, I mean, I I can, uh, it's funny. I didn't. So I was one of those people who couldn't even use a tampon because of the fear of coming into contact with my genitals. It took me well into my twenties to be able to do that and not have at as much of an adverse response. And it didn't, it really wasn't until into my thirties until I'd really started doing trauma work that I recognized the difference between not having a disgust response, like being able to do that action and being like, oh, that's just something I do because that's yeah, just how like my body neutral. is made. And yeah, I was very neutral. And it was really interesting because I didn't even notice the I didn't notice the shame and disgust response. That was just my normal until it was gone. And I was like, oh, wow, I spent 10, 15 years that every month, multiple times a month, I had this response toward my body. And it's interesting because I really thought that was isolated. You know, when I growing up or whatever, I was like, oh, this is just a me problem. But especially since moving here to the South, I have heard more and more like it is it is like this maybe unspoken expectation for women in the South where you don't use that for menstruation because Mm -hmm. not only of coming into contact with your genitals, but the fact that that could be seen as a a penetrative act that could somehow impact your virginity. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, like it, it harms, it harms people on levels that we can't even understand maybe yet like how how deeply uh those teachings go yeah oh Oh, absolutely (laughs) take a breath i know know. anytime (laughs) i get into conversation about this with other folks who do this work i feel like there's almost there's a relief in in being able to talk to other professionals who i mean you both understand it on a personal level as well but just to be like you know, it can be isolating being a Mm -hmm. practitioner in these day, this day and age where you're like virtual and on social media. So to like be in a, essentially a room with other people that like understand, I'm like, we could talk about this for hours. Why aren't we just like sitting around a table with some beverages right now? (laughs) I mean, I think, I think you create, you know, suggest maybe an idea that we should probably put together at some point. (laughs) I, I second that. Absolutely. Um, and one thing, the other thing, this I thought of this a moment ago when you were referring to um, clients with past experiences with other therapists, because even in the world of licensed therapy and mm-hmm. secular counseling and psychology, you still have so many folks like clinicians who are just so 
unaware and uneducated and ignorant. And I, I don't mean that derogatory, but yeah. ignorant of, of purity culture, of religious trauma, of the impacts that that has on folks. And so, because I've had clients too, where they're like, I had a, this therapist, they were a great therapist, but we got hung up on this trauma piece and they were just convinced that I was sexually mm. assaulted. And I I don't think I ever was. And so now, and then they're like scrounging around for repressed memories. Maybe I've repressed yeah. something. And it's like, yeah. I, I don't think you did. You spent once we unpack, you know, the background of the fundamentalist church that you grew up in and just all the things it's like it actually makes a lot of sense and and yet unfortunately there are a lot of even licensed clinicians out there that kind of get almost this deer in the headlights of like oh my god like i don't know what's going on here i i know um you know my work is is as a sex educator and i am very conscientious about staying in my lane and that often means referring people to therapy but it can be so difficult, especially depending on where they live, to find a yeah. therapist who is trained or qualified to deal with religious trauma or to deal with mm. sexual trauma in a way that understands the religious perspective. So mm. there have been times that I've worked with clients and they sometimes already have a therapist. But once we start unpacking things, they're like, I think I need to switch therapists because mm-hmm. some of them are mm-hmm. like, my therapist doesn't even really I can't imagine talking about sex with her or I started this therapy when I was still a Christian and this is a Christian therapist. Mm -hmm. Um, So as you know, in my working relationship with people, sometimes it does, it very often involves like, let's find you a therapist that can support you in this area. And that might Mm -hmm. mean like a breaking up with the therapist you have right Mm now. Yeah. I mean, that's a shameless plug for like, the company that both Andrew and I are a part of, oh, you know, I 1000% refer we, people to you all yeah. the time. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. But that, but it was exactly what you said is the reason we started it because I know for me personally, as a clinician, I had this list of people that was about four years long going, I, I don't want to go to my therapist and have to pay them to educate them about this thing and convince them. Mm-hmm. And so I, I really can appreciate that you, you not only recognize your limitations, which I think a lot of coaches don't, um, that's something we really try to do too, is like, Hey, yeah. we've got to stay in our lane, but that you, you know, yeah, I can appreciate that you see like, Hey, there, there's an importance of people having a level of understanding or at the very least that you don't have to convince your therapist or your coach that, yes, it really was this bad or, you know, this is trauma. Oh yeah. I, that's a whole other soapbox I could get on. Can you do some CEU trainings about purity culture? I would happily join like, you know, it's it's a professional development area that Mm -hmm. as people come out, there's, there's not enough therapy for them. There's not enough qualified therapists for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know I, that's, I was approached by a pretty big, like kind of CEU company to do, to ask, to do a curriculum on things like religious trauma and purity culture. So in all my spare time, I'm going to do that. Um, <laughs> but, but to your point, yes, I think that's part of the problem is exactly what you're seeing is that there's not a lot of even resources for clinicians mm-hmm. to be able to a- adequately and effectively work with people coming out of high control religions and systems of control, power and control that are traditionally seen as helpful and supportive. Yeah. And I would take it even one step further and say that, especially if you are, you know, the average person born and raised in America or raised in America, you were raised in, we're all raised in a very sex negative culture that is purity culture influenced. So Mm -hmm. it's not, the being in a church and being in a high control religion, that's like deep purity culture. But the values that kind of undergird the whole thing exist in American society. So, you know, being told right. that like, you know, women especially need to save themselves. There are people out there that are like, but why is that traumatic? I don't understand how that's traumatic. That's just how it is. Like, so if you are, if you have not really thought critically about sexuality messaging in general that we get from society, culture, pop culture, then Mm -hmm. I think, you know, that makes a, it it creates a barrier to being able to even talk about sex as a therapist. Like Mm -hmm. some therapists Mm -hmm. are like, 
I can't talk about sex with my clients because they've never done that kind of examination of their own feelings and values around it. That's not even purity yeah. culture therapy. Mm-hmm. That's just regular therapy where your clients mm-hmm. like talk, wants to talk about sex. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're yeah. really, I mean, I think you're bringing up such a good point and I know we'll ask about it shortly here, but just kind of seeing that need for like practitioners, but then you also providing that need of going like, we're going to just have some very frank conversations <laughs> about, you know, the basics of sex and sexuality yeah. and gender and sexual activity and all those things. And I think that is so important. This is really brought up in my mind too, just talking about like even clinicians, like who have lots of like misconceptions and ideas or lack thereof when it comes to purity culture. I'm I'm curious what in your work, what are some of the most common misconceptions that you see people having about mm-hmm. purity culture? Uh, like outsiders, the misconceptions that other outsiders yeah, have? Those who, yeah, like those who have not grown up mm-hmm. in it, that are kind of looking at it from the outside, so to speak. Yeah. I I love that you asked me that because I, I feel like I am in a unique position to answer that as someone who also didn't grow up in it. But I think a big misconception is that it's not that bad. It can't be that bad. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, so you were mm-hmm. told that you couldn't have sex when you were a teenager. Big deal. You shouldn't be having sex as a teenager anyway. Like just the idea that it couldn't possibly be that bad. Or I would say this is this is like a you know, a stereotype that the people who were raised in purity culture are, I don't know, they're bad themselves. Like if you're an atheist or a secular person, you might just be like, I don't care about them because they are, they are devout Christians. And Mm -hmm. I can't be bothered to, I don't know, expend my activist energy or my political energy or compassion to people who were part of a harmful system while not realizing, you know, that means they're not understanding that how systems of oppression, including cultish systems work Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. and how organized religion works. So an idea that like, it's your fault if you grew up in that environment, because you, you know, you chose to be Christian. And so whatever Mm -hmm. they do in that religion, that harmful religion, like I can't be bothered to care about Mm -hmm. them. Yeah. What about even with people that were in, like grew up in purity culture, what are misconceptions they have about themselves, their own sexuality, their gender, things like that, that you come across, or even misconceptions about being sexually active? It's hard to, I I find myself using the term normal and I know normal is such a loaded word. Um, I guess a better term for it would be just like common human experiences, but people I often work with people who seem to think like they are the most uniquely weird, messed up person. And then they tell me why. And I'm like, oh, you're having a sexual fantasy that is like one of the most common sexual fantasies that exists. Or, oh, you start masturbating at that age. You know, that's a really like common, normal part of Mm -hmm. human sexual Mm -hmm. development. Or you prefer this in bed. Do you... I want you to know that that is a very, very common thing Mm. that people prefer in bed. So, so Mm -hmm. many things where people, because there's so much silence on the topic, if no one's ever talked about it, you think you are the biggest weirdo. Like Mm. the things that I fantasize about are weird. The things that I've done, you know, maybe as a young person when I was trying to figure out my body are weird. And I'm like, no, you are a curious regular ass human. And that is all very, (laughs) very normal. Um, And nothing that you have told me puts you um, on some, you know, puts you out of the realm of ordinary in terms Mm -hmm. of your sexual development, in terms of your sexual experiences. Mm, I love that. Yeah. I think that's so important for folks to hear just normalizing. I think I had a conversation like that just the other day with someone, not even a client. So, um, but just like, yeah, what you went through is like that. It makes sense that you're experiencing what you are and why just all the things like it makes sense. Like you're not mm. abnormal or broken or it's not no. a pathology. It's not a pathology. No, you know? I see, you know, everything gets pathology. Every sort of experience of sexuality is pathologized in purity culture. So when people are like, mm. you know, I was thinking about sex this much when I was in high school and they feel like that means they're sex addicts or that means they were hypersexual. And I'm like, you're describing a very ordinary mm-hmm. experience of human sexuality. Like mm-hmm. it's not, you You were not 
an over-sexualized, hypersexual young person because you masturbated sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing that I, I'm thinking of is because there's so much silence around bodies and the processes of bodies, people just think like that their their genitals are uniquely gross or weird or ugly. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I have folks do is go to, I have these like two trusty websites. One is just like, non-sexual medicalized images of Mm. penises and one is of vulvas. And I'm like, look at all of these varieties, like, and then tell me that you think that there's something uniquely weird about you. Like it's just just bodies being bodies. Um, Mm. But if there's so much silence around it and so much shame around it, seeing those images for the first time is, is profound. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that you mentioned something. I'm curious to know more because um, I know I thought this that I have talked to so many folks coming out of purity culture that really believe they had a sex and or porn addiction because mm-hmm. they simply engaged with things like masturbation or watching porn. And we're not even talking like excessive amounts, yes. but I know there was a, like a brief period of time where I was like, oh my gosh, am I a sex addict? Because I, uh, you know, like I masturbate a couple times a week or even yeah. maybe a, every day or whatever. And I, I was mortified because that's all I had been taught. Right. So I'm just curious, is that something you see with people coming out? Is that something regardless of gender that you kind of see as a fear or questions, confusion. Yeah. Um, it tends to be a that particular burden, I'm sure you've seen it too, falls so much more heavily on men. And yeah. you know, mm-hmm. men, trans who trans men, uh, cis men, just men in mm-hmm. general feeling like they are the ones whose sexuality is dangerous and therefore, you know. You've probably seen this studies that show the studies that show that like the higher your religiosity, the more likely you are to self-identify as a sex addict or a porn mm-hmm. addict. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm thinking specifically of I, I had a few sessions with a guy once where I was helping him with like kind of dating after divorce, dating after mm-hmm. a very like purity culture marriage. And he said that his former wife and their pastor had intervened and insisted that he go to a sex rehab and a porn rehab because he looked at porn four to five times a year. Mm. At the time he accepted that that was okay. You're probably right. I, yeah, I've heard that from people that have, you know, slipped up and looked at it once a year or, you know, and it's just, it is heartbreaking. Oh my gosh. Yeah. They're like, because I yeah. couldn't resist that, that means they're right about me. Um, that's mm. what this guy had said. Like, well, I yeah. just figured, you know, their point was you looked at it, you you looked at it again, you looked at it another time, therefore, this is a problem for you. And mm. uh, I, uh yeah. you know, one of the things that I one of the aspects of like post-purity culture sex education that I'm the most passionate about is educating people also on how the sort of Christian evangelical take on pornography is sometimes more harmful than just casually looking at pornography itself. And that is a Mm. loaded statement and I stand by it. (laughs) I'm happy to elaborate, but please do. Yeah, yeah. please do. (laughs) Okay. So (laughs) about a year ago in a late summer of 2022, I taught a class that's, um, called a porn conversation for purity culture dropouts. And the reason mm-hmm. I decided that this was a, ta- a class that needed to be done to be done is because I I kept working with clients who were taught only the sort of uh porn kills love aspect of pornography that the what they learned about pornography all came from the church. And having not come from the church, I was like listening to these you know, perspectives like, you know, it's, it's addictive. It's, it's a public health crisis. It changes your brain. And I'm like, I want to, I want to look into these claims. So I started Mm -hmm. researching for the class and I was actually surprised personally to discover that it is really, really hard to find accurate info about porn addiction because the religious perspective has bled so Mm -hmm. much into the pop psychology, secular perspective. Mm -hmm. And an example would be 
I see a headline that's like, this is how porn damages relationships. And it's in a men's health magazine. Men's health isn't a Christian publication. We know this. It's like Mm -hmm. men's health is about like having strong erections and like biceps. Right. So I, I read the article and the person that they're quoting, he has a book. I go look up this person and he is a professor at a small private evangelical college. Mm. And I'm like, he is getting a platform in men's health, not because men's health is a Christian publication, but because I don't think they know any different. They're just like, this is a porn expert. Mm-hmm. And so that is um, just a tiny example of how difficult it is to find scientific information mm-hmm. done by researchers, done by public health professionals who don't have some sort of tie to either Mormonism or evangelical Christianity. And Mm -hmm. the information that we're by and large getting as a culture is filtered through the lens of a very conservative right-wing Christian take on sexuality. So Mm -hmm. what I want people to know is not that I'm saying all porn is great and you should love it, but I want you to know where you're getting your info from Mm -hmm. and that a lot of the organizations that put out this anti-porn information are organizations that also think the only acceptable form of sexual expression is inside a Christian hetero marriage. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the organizations like Exodus Cry, like uh, Fight the New Drug, yeah. like Nicosi, the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, they mm-hmm. sound pretty secular. They sound non-biased. They say they're non-biased, but if you dig at who started them, who works for them, uh, what other beliefs the folks that run these organizations have, you know, you're going to be like, oh, you campaigned against gay marriage. Oh, you're behind this anti-trans bill. Like you're going to see that you're going to see the Mm -hmm. marriage of those things and then be like, do I want to be getting my information from these organizations? Mm -hmm. So as a sex educator, that is a big picture thing that I get very passionate about um, Mm -hmm. talking to people about porn literacy, not just in like, you should be aware that what you're seeing on screen isn't actual reality most of the time, but also Mm -hmm. porn literacy in terms of if you're being told to go to this for-profit religious-based rehab, I want Mm -hmm. you to be critical about this and I want you to ask questions. Well, it's always so interesting to me too, like Porn, like so many other things, when you take off the value of it and kind of neutralize it, it it gives you choice, right? So if you say you can't have the chocolate cake, all you want is the chocolate cake, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's how our human brains are yeah. wired. Yeah. So if if porn is this evil, dirty, disgusting, whatever, the enticement towards it is great. When we neutralize it and we say, you can have chocolate cake if you want, you can have as much as you want. Mm -hmm. You can have as much vanilla cake. You can have as much birthday confetti cake, whatever. It's like any time of day or night. (laughs) Yeah. There's whatever, like, it is amazing how fast your desire for cake goes away and, or you eat it when you want and you don't when you don't want. And I think the same is true when we're talking about porn, when we take these labels off of evil, dirty, disgusting, whatever, and we just say, it's a thing that you should be able to freely choose to watch. Of course, we want to do things in ethical ways. And Mm -hmm. there there are some brain studies on what, in terms of stimulation and how that can impact sex drive. Like, sure, but we want to choose that, not because it's evil, but because we go, Hey, for my health, um, this thing might not be the best. Just like eating five cakes might not be the best for me, or maybe it is like, that's okay. But it's so interesting when you take the moral value off of it, all of a sudden that enticement is like, eh, I, whatever. As a man growing up in purity culture in the church, Seventh-day Adventist church specifically, at 22 years old, I was all but told by a pastor that I was probably a sex addict and was given a copy of Every Man's Battle. Oh, yeah. oh gosh. Yes. <laughs> oh, complete with <laughs> complete with the little journal workbook too. Like it was the package deal. So, and and yeah, it's just so interesting because then just fast forward like three or four years after that, and I was. I don't think I realized I was deconstructing and leaving the church, but I was very much on my way out. And I was in grad school for counseling. I was seeing a therapist, a secular licensed therapist, and was explaining some of my background 
just with porn and just all of that, all of those things. And he was listening and he, that was not his background, but he was very good. And he was just listening and validating. And when I told him everything, he's like, Andrew, everything you described sounds like you're just a normal, you were a normal 22 year old guy. Like, I don't yeah. see any yeah. problematic things popping up here. Yeah. And the, it was almost like his lack of response, a reaction. Like he wasn't like, oh my God, you did what? Yeah. And he's like, he was like, dude, that's normal. Yeah. It was probably mm-hmm. like yawn, you know, like, <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> and, okay. And, yeah. And, and, and then like, Laura, like you were saying, like when suddenly that yeah. stigma and that shame is like taken off of it, it's like, suddenly it was like, my brain wasn't hyper fixated on this thing that was like this horrible yeah. thing that I shouldn't be doing or thinking about. And now it's like, I it literally doesn't even yeah. cross my mind anymore. It's not a source yeah. of distress anymore. And so, yeah, yeah it's really amazing. I'm so glad to hear you compare it to like food restriction because that's how mm-hmm. I compare it when I teach about it too. Mm-hmm. It's like if you intentionally restrict mm-hmm. your food intake, you are going to binge at some point. You're going to yes. you're going to create mm-hmm. an unhealthy relationship yeah. with food. And there was there was a study done um on I think it was done on men who self-identified as porn addicts to see if neutralizing pornography and making it not a big deal would change their behavior. And it absolutely resulted in just so much less of a desire and so much mm-hmm. less of a compulsion around yeah. viewing of pornography. They're just like, yeah. if you just tell them like, you can see it if you want, you can't, if you, you don't have to see it, it's not going to ruin your life. If you look at it, yeah. the desire to look at it went down. That was a study mm-hmm. through the university of Utah, I believe. Wow. Oh, interesting. This is a whole other conversation, but we start to see then that when we put value value labels on things, it does allow for greater control. And it we can control a person, we can control narratives, mm-hmm. and it allows for that systemic mm-hmm. control. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so when we say here's this awful, gross sin, and you should feel ashamed about it, the likelihood that you will feel shame is very high. And oftentimes the way to alleviate the shame is by engaging in the activity that's bringing upon the shame in the first place, which then creates more shame. And, you know, we go in this cycle and we go that, that then I'm open to hearing, yes, I'm a sex addict. I'm a porn addict. You need to go to this treatment. You need this accountability. You need us to tell you what to do. And Mm -hmm. it just, you, we start to see how it becomes so easy to control others. For sure. And something you said just really reminded me, I, I just finished a wonderful book called Cultish, mm-hmm. The Language of Fanaticism. Yeah, so good. By yeah. Amanda Montel. That book, mm-hmm. my husband bought me it for my birthday because that's the kind of birthday gifts. <laughs> I scream, I want to read a cult book, but it's true. I did. Oh, I love uh, it. But, you know, in the book, the, the way she breaks down, like how leaders use language to control people is, Mm -hmm. you know, the language around pornography and pornography, quote unquote, addiction in, Mm -hmm. you know, in books like Every Man's Battle in ministries that are anti-porn ministries, like you can see the language, the in-community language is so clear. The terms that are being used, the way it's described, that book just uh, like it made so many things make sense, but I hadn't put it together with like the language of Mm -hmm. Porn and mm-hmm. sex addiction. That's yeah. it's a niche, like, yeah, you get people yeah. in that world and it, it seems it seems to make sense. The language yeah. Yeah. Sense. Yeah. I don't know if you've read um Shannon. So Josh Harris, you know, kind of poster mm-hmm. child of purity culture back in the day. His ex-wife just came out with a book. And one of the oh, concepts that she Okay, yeah, it, it literally, as we're recording this, just came out a week ago. Okay. So I I got to read it early and one of the things she talked about cuz she did not grow up in a religious context and of course purity culture was just really coming onto the forefront of of you know kind of the secular scene or whatnot but you know one of the things she hits on is that they would say these messages over and over and then at some point I just started to believe that was true about me. And um, she was interviewed for an article on Slate that came out, I think this past weekend, where she goes, you know, the things that I had done sexually were not only very normal in terms of like my age, where I was at developmentally, you know, I had this committed relationship with my boyfriend in college or whatever. She's like, they they weren't that bad. You know, they're very normal. 
but then in that context, they're kind of painting me as this dirty whore who's engaged in this explicit sexual acts, you know, party girl, whatever, you know, kind of the labels that they put on her. And she's like, and, and I just eventually started to believe it. And I thought that that's really what it was. And I really had sinned against my future husband and I had sinned against God. And so tying that together with like the cultish piece and this, like, there is specific language that's used. And when it's repeated over and over by so many people, we do start to internalize it. It's that concept of introjection where all of a sudden then we believe that's coming from within us. And we're like, oh, hmm. yeah, I am a sex addict or I do need to repent. I have sinned against my future spouse and that that's a problem. And I now need Christian support, counseling, whatever for it. Well, now I have another book to add to my list. So there you then. go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this is almost too so broad of a question and I almost feel unfair asking it, but I have to ask anyway. <laughs> if you could speak just directly to folks who are coming out of purity culture backgrounds or perhaps are still even in it, I'm just so curious. What do you think is important for them to know? I want people to know, and you know, I think this goes for everyone in the world, honestly, that like sex and sexuality are such a fundamental piece of who we are as human beings and to be terrified of everything related to sex. It doesn't have to be that way. And once you learn about sex, it is a less terrifying topic. Um, Mm. But, you know, it's weird to me that a, that a job like sex education is like, Oh, I can't believe you do that. It's like, it's, it should be such a part of, our lives that we don't even need special people to teach us about it, honestly. So, you know, that's, that's one message I want people to know is like human sexuality is just such a fundamentally, it's just a human part of us. It's just, it's us. Um, Mm -hmm. And also that it is never too late to work on your relationship to it. It is never too late to identify how you really feel and believe about sexuality. It's never too late to change your mind about it. It's never too late to explore aspects of it. And I get a lot of hearing that from people that are like, you know, I deconstructed and now I'm single and I'm 40 and I'm just realizing I'm queer. And now I just, uh, I miss so much time. And I'm like, that is true. You, you did, you know, you are 40 now. Maybe you, you can feel grief for those years, but don't get stuck in that because it is never too late to experiment. It's never too late to experience. It's never too late to experience the full um, spectrum of your sexuality. Sexual exploration does not just belong to young people. Get it. Giving yourself a new label that feels right. Isn't just for 20 somethings like you. It's not too late. Um, I had a woman buy my sexual values workbook. And she was in her seventies and she had just gotten out of a cult. And that makes me so happy to know. And I'm like, you you don't have to just be like, well, it's my story's over because I'm X, Y, Z old. Like Mm. it it doesn't have to be that way. Cause sexuality is part of our lives until we die. Yes. Mm -hmm. Even if you die when you're 114. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's so true. I love that. Yeah. And and as we're just wrapping up, you know, one of the last questions that we'd like to ask people is like, is there anything you wish we would have asked you that we have not already? <laughs> hmm. I think something that I love to talk about is do I see people heal and do I see success stories? And all the yeah. time, all yeah. the time. Um, mm-hmm. one of my favorite populations to compassionately and gently educate or the folks who consider themselves late virgins and the putting the term virginity in quotes, um, people who have never had a sexual experience with a partner and they are outside of the age range where we tend to find that acceptable. So mm-hmm. people who are in their late twenties, thirties, forties and older who were like, I don't know, it's, I probably can't ever have sex because I haven't had it now. And, um, I love working with those folks and then hearing back after a certain time and hearing people say things like, I had my sexual debut last night and it was wonderful. And Mm. my partner was so compassionate and they didn't even know that I was new to this because I was such a good communicator. And Mm. I learned, you know, how to communicate from you. And I get those messages 
regularly and they absolutely make my whole life. Like yeah. just hearing someone be like, I was so afraid and you were right. Like I didn't have so much to be scared of. And I had my first, I had my sexual debut at 35 and like, it's just, it's the best. So yeah, I want to, I like to share those happy mm. stories and the, mm. you know, the healing is absolutely possible. And I do think it requires a combo of therapy and education mm. for a yeah. lot of people. It makes that makes my heart so happy to hear that there's people having these experiences. Cause you know, I think I can't speak for Andrew, but I can guess that for him as well as I, like so many times we hear stories that are the opposite where it is really overwhelming and intense. And it does leave so much of that trauma energy that's then coursing through the body. And so I just, I love being able to hear those stories of people that are like, yeah, I was really intentional about this. And I, I learned how to do things in a way that felt really good and safe for me. And, and then I had this amazing experience. Like, yeah. that's incredible. I, I love, love it. like guiding people through their, you know, sometimes they'll have a session with me before the sexual debut and then we'll check in after, and then they'll be like, and then I did it again. And it's just, it's just a joyous thing to, uh, yeah you know, kind of guide people through that. Well, Erica, it has been such a joy to be able to talk to you today. I'm so grateful that you've given us your time and and knowledge and expertise. And I'm just wondering if you can share a little bit about where you can be found if you're taking on clients, maybe a little bit about your purity culture dropout program, um, because I want people to be able to access you. Yeah, of course. So my main hub is Instagram. And on Instagram, I'm ericasmith.sex.ed. Um, Erica spelled with a C. And then my website is puritycultureDropout.com. Very easy to remember. And I always am taking uh, one-on-one individual clients. And this fall, I will be doing a cohort of Purity Culture Dropout where I kind of uh, educate folks as a group uh, through weekly sessions. So if you are interested in being part of that group, I would say just give me a follow or get on my email list because that's how I'll announce it. It's been so great to talk to you today. And I'm just really grateful to have had this conversation. Honestly, I think it's something that's so important. And actually, as we were touching on this during our conversation, important both for like clients we work with, but then also just recognizing the limitations in the clinical community. Like it's, there's just Mm -hmm. such a need on all fronts for these types of conversations Mm -hmm. to be being had. Yeah. I love it. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm grateful to be part of your community. Oh, okay. Wow. Um, I'm just like letting all of this kind of marinate, uh, like drop in. I, I really love the episode. I think because there's just so many things I want to dig into, like on a personal level. And like Erica was saying, you know, we are like, we could all get around a table and just like chat about this stuff. And it never ceases to amaze me that Every time I hear about others' experience with impurity culture, like it, there's a little part of me that feels a little bit more relief because, you know, the, there's so many things that happened that I'm just like, is that normal? Like, did I go through this? You know, is this just me? And like, so yeah, anytime I hear, you know, somebody say, I work with clients and they deal with this, there is that little part of me that's healed. That's like, yeah. That's not just you. That was ah, that that was yeah. a, a direct result of purity culture. So I love those moments and I was really touched by that. Same here. It's so it is like what you just said. It's so incredibly validating to realize like you're not some outlier. This is not an anomaly. Mm-hmm. Like what you went through, it makes sense that your body would be mm-hmm. responding the way that yeah. it is. Like like physiologically, mm-hmm. for example, like some of the stuff that comes up for those of us who came mm-hmm. out of purity culture backgrounds and that yeah. and then and then also I think um the other piece that's just so important and of course I know you and I both live in the Bible belt where I think it's more pronounced yeah. but it's like mm-hmm. it's not even church culture overtly it's just culture mm-hmm. it's just the yeah. culture a lot of this it like is. things that I think folks take for granted and don't even realize or recognize mm-hmm. as purity mm-hmm. culture it's it's just it's the standard I really think that unless at least where we're at kind of in this Bible belt area, if you are not in a bigger city um, where Mm -hmm. there is more diversity of thoughts, bodies, Mm -hmm. opinions, stances, 
if you are anywhere outside of that, like these teachings are just your norm. And it's not necessarily connected to religion, although many people would consider themselves Christian. But yeah, like this is this is the norm. And I think about like, I can't remember if I said this on the last episode, but one of the school groups that I was involved in was called Enable Education Now Babies Later, where we would go into schools and I I was at a public school and we would teach abstinence uh, programs. And now we couldn't, I don't believe we could teach like, abstinence until marriage because God says so. But the message was more like abstinence until you're ready to deal with the potential consequences of an adult decision, like getting pregnant or Mm -hmm. having a a sexually transmitted uh, disease or infection. And so, um, and that, but that was public school and it was publicly funded too, because that was when the law had been passed, you know, for um, abstinence only sex education received more funding in school. And so I just look at that and I'm like, it is no wonder that we have a entire generation or more than one generation that has grown up with such um, inadequate sex education. And we're now seeing incredibly negative results as, as a response to that. It really is remarkable. And it's like, it just shows me how important these conversations are. Yeah. You know, I, I just, I, they can't be had enough. I agree. I'm so grateful that Erica was like willing to come on to our podcast. Mm. She has such a wealth of knowledge and um, I, I've downloaded her books or she has like several workbooks that she has via PDF. I've downloaded those um, over the years and they're just really um, thought provoking. I, I think it doesn't even matter kind of where you're at in your kind of coming out of purity culture process. There's just really helpful questions and resources uh, to think through and to utilize. And I would I would encourage anybody to grab those resources or consider joining her groups or working with her because she really does do excellent work. And I think there's something about her, the, what she said as a guest, you know, like she didn't grow up in this, but she grew up, you know, witnessing it and then seeing it in the clients that she worked with. For me, there's something really special and redemptive about this like outsider who's willing to put in the time and work to become educated and then make it her life's passion to help help us, <laughs> you know? Um, I think that, yeah. you know, she carry she carries some hope with her that some of us that grew up in it don't have at the outset. And so for her to go like, there is life outside of this and it is good. Mm-hmm. I don't know. There's something really special about that. Yes. And then, yeah, absolutely. And then just the whole idea of like, it's not too late. It's never too yeah. late to yeah. start living life the way you want to, you know, yeah. and, and that you deserve good things and that just all of that. Cause I, yeah. I definitely encounter that a lot, I think with folks and I went through it myself mm-hmm. of like, wow, it really would have been nice to have known and experienced some of these things that I'm learning now in my own healing. Like it would have been nice to be where I am now, like 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, Right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Such, such a good interview. Okay. Well, before we sign off for the day, we are going to answer a listener question. And you know what? When I say we, I mean me, or maybe we as in me and the Holy Spirit. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Um, anyways, we, uh, we have gotten some great listener questions. I selected one of them for today and I'm going to take my best, uh, stab at answering it. So the question that we received is, can you talk more about CPTSD in relation to spiritual trauma? I love this question. It's one that I've actually gotten several times and one that I work on a lot with my clients. If you have not listened to our very first episode, What is Religious Trauma? I would highly, highly encourage you to do so. Uh, We talk a lot about what is trauma. Um, We talk about complex trauma and how religious trauma often falls under the umbrella of complex trauma because of the magnitude of overwhelming events, the inescapable nature, and the consistent and persistent uh, fear, threat, and overwhelm. So I really feel like, especially for those of us who grew up in high control religion, that diagnosis or that umbrella of complex PTSD is usually what tends to fit our experiences just a little bit better. So when we talk about CPTSD in relation to spiritual trauma, we're actually kind of talking about in 
my opinion, one of the same, one in the same things. Now, sometimes though, people talk about spiritual in the context of like holistic. So everything is spiritual, right? It hits us on this soul level. And I don't mean soul, soul, like S-O-U-L, like in the sense of how we might use it in religion, where we're saving souls for Christ. I'm talking about soul as in spirit essence, the essence of who we are. That's our spiritual selves. Don't feel like you have to ascribe that to a certain faith tradition, religion, or spiritual practice. But um, yeah, that's kind of how I view when we say spiritual trauma, kind of this, this essence of who we are, the core of who we are. We are spiritual beings. Um, we have more than uh, you know, just our our body or behaviors. We've got emotions. We've got sensations. Like we've got this holistic thing. If you're looking for, this is just the caveat, if you're looking for a pretty comprehensive resource on spiritual trauma, I would highly recommend uh, Dr. Hillary McBride's uh, podcast series called Holy Hurt. It is absolutely wonderful. Uh, she she does a deep dive into what is spiritual trauma? Uh, how is it just trauma? What are some of the resources that we have to heal it? And she goes into various aspects of what can cause spiritual trauma. Episode four in particular is maybe one of the best descriptions I have ever heard of the connection between childhood or developmental trauma and spiritual trauma. So I'd really encourage you to listen to that. It is available on any podcast platform. It is Holy Hurt by Dr. Hillary McBride. And I'll make sure to put those in that name in the show notes as well. So when we talk about CPTSD in relation to spiritual trauma, I think it's important to recognize that CPTSD is not a guarantee if you've experienced trauma. Sometimes trauma does result in CPTSD or PTSD. Other times trauma may result in a variety of other physical, physiological, and psychological issues. So what we might call mental health disorder. Um, That could be things like anxiety, depression, social phobias, OCD, um, relational issues, things like that. It can also result in physiological and or physical issues such as gastrointestinal issues, sexual dysfunction, autoimmune disorders. Spiritual trauma or trauma of any sort does not only result in CPTSD or PTSD and sometimes doesn't result in that at all. We can have trauma, we can have experienced trauma and it not result in PTSD or CPTSD. Now, the research does show that the longer we endure specific situations of overwhelm, the more likely it is that it would result in CPTSD, but it's not guaranteed for every person. So I do want to make sure that that is understood. But when we talk about spiritual trauma, we might we might kind of consider that it's it's wounding or injury at our very deepest, our very core level. We want to call that our identity, the essence of who we are. Trauma fragments that. It um, it injures that. And so when we look at healing spiritual trauma, we are looking at getting back to our sense of inherent goodness. Uh, we are looking at finding a sense of connection to ourselves and then to the world, to others and to a higher power if that's important or real for you. Now, spiritual trauma could lead to CPTSD. um, And and when we say spiritual trauma, also, we might be talking similar to religious trauma. Spiritual can sometimes be a bit of an adjective to give us a little bit more context under around which the environment that the trauma occurred. So we might consider that spiritual trauma uh, occurs from church situations or religious situations or um, situations where um, we're communing with others, where there's maybe a dynamic of hierarchy within like a, a leader and you know parishioners, things like that. That's where we might look at some of the contextual factors. And so when we're looking to heal that, because it is so complex, we're looking at what I call integration. And that is going to be how do we, you know, 
understand and notice when we're triggered? How do we notice when things aren't quite right? How do we notice when we're feeling like, even though we might consciously know we're in the present, it feels like we're in the past. And so we might look for ways then to integrate that, to help get ourselves back present and connected into this moment and to find resources and coping skills that help us come back to a place of safety. That's really what kind of the crux of um, resolving and recovering from complex trauma which of course we're putting spiritual trauma under that umbrella. That's the crux of what that work is. It's it's integrating. When we talk about things that are complex trauma, it means that there's not usually just one or two really big, scary, overwhelming events. We're talking about a lot of little, littler things that are happening over time that are threatening, that are overwhelming, that are causing us to be in states of hypervigilance. And those things wear us down and our nervous system is constantly on high alert to make sure that we're staying alive. And so um, in a therapeutic sense, we just can't go back and process every single one of those moments because it would take the rest of our lives. And for so many of us, we don't even remember all of those moments. And so when we're talking about this process of resolution uh, from complex trauma, we're talking about starting to recognize the internal cues of the body, being able to find a sense of internalized safety, regardless of what's happening on the outside of us. And then we are looking to be able to utilize different coping skills and connections in order to help us come to a place of safety. And I think that's the case in spiritual trauma as well. So I hope that could add a little bit of clarification, or maybe it just brought up more questions. I'm not sure. I think that was a really wonderful question. I think it's really complex. Uh, Again, I'm going to uh, point you to Dr. Hillary McBride's work, uh, Holy Hurt. She, it's just, it's a really, really wonderful series. And I would really encourage you to listen to it if you're wanting to know more and understanding how those two things operate in tandem with one another. So with that, we are done with another episode of the Sunday School Dropouts. It's been so wonderful to be in your ear uh, a little bit this week, and we hope that you will come back for our next episode, which will drop in just a couple weeks.